What's up, y'all? What's up, man? We're the Thralls of Metal. I'm Shredlord. Jam and John. I'm the Tommy. Necrotic Nick. And today we're going to bring you an excellent discography from the Mighty Iron Maiden. Hailing from England, this five-piece is one of the most influential bands in the entire metal genre. Combining badass groove pockets with dual guitar harmonies and incredible solos with the searing vocals and thumping bass lines became a staple and 16 <coughs> albums worth, at least studio albums worth, of some really solid ass music. Now because the discography is 16 discs long, we're going to dive right into it. The very first Iron Maiden album is 1980's Iron Maiden. This was their very first album. This was not the Iron Maiden that everyone's accustomed to. This was no Adrian Smith yet. This was Dennis Stratton on guitar um, with Paul Diano on vocals and Clive Burr on drums. Um, a little interesting tidbit that I learned about the album was that the producer they had was somebody that didn't really give a shit about the album and he didn't really care so they were pretty displeased with that and even tried to replace him a couple times but didn't care for the other guys they tried out so Steve Harris just thought that it would be okay to just stick with the guy who didn't give a shit because they could just kind of bypass him since he really wasn't paying attention anyway and do it the way they wanted to um, the only thing that I've heard otherwise about this album was that they weren't crazy about the way the engineer mixed it once again I think these particular people just didn't give a shit. However, I think a lot of people like the fact that it sounds so raw. So it turned out to be okay in their favor. John, what do you think about this album? Well, I mean, it was their first run. So, you know, you can't expect the world on your first run. I, I think, though, it was an excellent representation of what would come for Iron Maiden in the future. Um, the great guitar solos, um, the really jam an album. I mean, it got better as they progressed, obviously, because it was their first album. This was actually number 10 on my list, so I have I, no complaints. I just think it was meat and potatoes and a good place to start. Everyone loves meat and potatoes. The Tommy. What yeah. you feeling, dog? <laughs> <laughs> I had this album at number four. I liked this album. It definitely felt like their first album. You know, it was definitely raw. I liked that a lot. I really liked the progginess of it. There was lots of shred on it. Um, there's shred on every Iron Maiden album, and you know, started with the shred. A couple standout tracks for me: uh, "Strange World," damn the feels in that song. I absolutely loved them. Um, "Transylvania," killer song. "Phantom of the Opera," the second half of that song, absolutely amazing. Nick. Well, I have this at number 10 as well. Um, it ranks a little bit lower, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad album. Uh, as you brought up the, with the production, it didn't sound like the carrots. The production was uneven, so it sounded different from song to song. That too. But there were killer songs, like Phantom of the Opera, uh, Remember Tomorrow, fantastic song, one of my favorites on there, uh, Transylvania also as well. And it's really cool because at this point you can really hear their influences, like the bands that influence them, like Thin Lizzy and Uriah Heep. You really hear that in this album. But it got better. So this one fell a little bit lower. All right. Moving on to the second album, which would be 1981's Killers. Now... I have a new lineup change. We got rid of Dennis Stratton on guitar. I believe the history there was, it wasn't that he couldn't hang or, I think it was just creative differences. He wanted to be a little bit more polished and I think uh, radio friendly and that really wasn't what they were going for. So they amicably split and in walks Adrian Smith to, in my opinion, complete the greatest guitar duo of all time in Dave Murray and Adrian Smith. Killers is filled with classic Iron Maiden tunes has two instrumentals Rothschild 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 who yeah. gives a shit child <laughs> tomato tomato my friends abandoned um, child apparently <laughs> oh bomb ass song they still play it live that's one of the few they actually play from killers live the energy was there the production was so much better i actually um forgot to mention that this would be the very first album with producer martin birch who would be their main producer for all the way up to, I believe it's Fear of the Dark, if I'm correct. Um, 
I'll double check myself later on, but <laughs> yeah, Martin Birch, in my opinion, was a big part of their sound because he really encouraged them and was a really good producer for them. He uh, didn't try to make them be anything that they weren't. He just tried to nurture and keep growing what was already going on. John, how do you feel about old, <laughs> old killers? I think you uh, hold this one in high regard. Yeah, this was actually my number one to me uh, overall throughout the course of their the remainder of their discography. I think this record sounds sonically the best like i like that raw kind of gritty sound and the high the, energy for sure yeah high energy it's got a real proggy feel to it the the overall song structure in my opinion the way the songs were actually put together is pretty top notch i don't have a single complaint about this record it hit my number one all the way tome <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I had Killers at number 10. You know, it was a great album. Wrathchild is one of my favorite Iron Maiden songs. Always has been. Steve Harris is the absolute shit. You know, you cannot go wrong with Steve Harris. It, it was thrashy, proggy, great leads all over the album, great riffs all over the album. Um, Genghis Khan, great instrumental, really good. I to March. Uh, the, the breakdown in Prodigal Son. Damn. Yes. Yep. Damn. <laughs> Damn, son. I had it at number three. This is the first Iron Maiden album I ever bought when I was a kid, and it sticks with me to this day. Like It's one of my favorite jams. Uh, the title track and the song Purgatory Alone are ones that just always like just stick with me. Killer choruses, great writing. Almost entirely written by Steve Harris, and yep. wow, does he have a flair for songwriting. All but two songs. Oh, I thought it was entirely him. Adrian Smith had some credits on this one, didn't he? That is correct. That's why he's let him write. He's pretty good at it. Uh, but yeah, like I really liked Paul Diano's vocal performance on this one, too. I thought he yeah. did an excellent job. Paul sounded good. And yeah, it, I like the fact that it was raw. There's like yeah, maybe hints of stuff that was a little bit punkier, too. I just I liked it. It's just a fun, fast-paced <laughs> album. All right. In walks in number three, 1982's Number of the Beast. Again, another lineup change in Iron Maiden. Out leaves Paul Diano. I believe that Steve Harris knew they wanted to continue a certain way, and Paul just wasn't the guy for it, even though his earlier stuff with Maiden had been kick-ass. Uh, so in walks... Bruce the Air Raid Siren Dickinson and we are incredibly close to it's like the Voltron of Iron Maiden <laughs> we're one album away from being like full on Voltron we haven't know? got the head yet we got the chest yeah, maybe we an have, arm or two we need the head no the legs, <laughs> the you legs. Know, he's the support okay got it yeah right. so he's going to be the chest because the lungs okay I'm good with that <laughs> Now, one funny thing that I read about this album is all the social conservatives lost their fucking minds thinking that Iron Maiden was satanic. It's the devil! <laughs> and what's funny about it is 95% of the time when these people do that, it's bullshit, and they just make the bands more popular. So, if that had anything to do with pushing Iron Maiden into more homes, keep doing what you do, people. No you fabulous, dumb bastards. <laughs> <laughs> But iconically, this is one of Iron Maiden's greatest albums. Um, 22 Acacia Avenue, Children of the Damned, Run to the Hills, Number of the Beast. I mean, these are still classic Iron Maiden songs that hold through to this day. Um, and I think with one more album working together, Adrian Smith and Dave really started to weave their parts into each other and just become this fucking guitar machine. Tommy, what do you think about this? Yeah, I love this album. I had it at number two. It's definitely up there for me. So many classic songs. First album with Bruce. Um, feels like a, a really a new wave for Iron Maiden bringing Bruce in. A couple of my favorite songs, Hollow Be Thy Name. Incredible song. Number of the Beast, Run of the Hills. Of course, those are givens. Even though they're some of the most popular songs, they're incredible songs. And again, I'll mention Steve Harris. Just because, god damn. John. <laughs> god damn. How do you follow god damn? God damn. <laughs> By saying this is my number five? I don't know how that really correlates. That's a good correlates start. No, to, it's a start. It's yeah. a okay. multi-step equation. So yeah, this would be my number five. Um, uh, great follow-up to Killers, although not my direct next in line as far as ranking is concerned. It was a great next mission on their voyage, so to speak. 
Um, the mix, as time goes on, the mix gets increasingly better. Songwriting gets increasingly better. Um, I just wanted to point out the, the prevalence of the bass in Children of the Damned. The, the, the bass in there sounds amazing and it just shreds nuts. Um, and of course, all the great jams are on this album. Run to the Hills, Hallowed Be Their Name. Um, I'm not a number! I'm a free man! <laughs> I don't know, you know, as, as things went on for me, I became more and more of a Maiden fan as the discography progressed, so... You're, he's such a smart boy. <laughs> Nick, what'd you think? <laughs> this is my number two. This is a certified classic as far as metal goes across the board, across every subgenre. This is known for a reason. I love the fact that guitar tone was heavier, and the interplay of the uh, harmonies back and forth were even tighter. Uh, <laughs> Some of their most recognizable songs are on here. One of the best album covers thing ever. I fucking love it. And uh, I mean, there's really not much else you can say about this. It's it's an insanely awesome album. That's you know, number two. Widely viewed as one of the best metal albums of all time. It should be on everyone's list. Like quite possibly at, at least a top twenty-five. It's got to be there. All right, keep on going down the road. 1983's Peace of Mind album. <laughs> Clive Burr exits Iron Maiden, and we have finally completed Voltron. In walks Nickel McBrain. Um, I believe he was in a French band. I forget the name of it. I knew it earlier today, but I forgot it. Uh, <laughs> Lay something. Lay, sure. Lay toast. <laughs> so, Lay uh, edit that out. <laughs> and the reason that Nickel McBrain was such a huge part of Iron Maiden is that he was a totally different kind of a drummer than Clive Burr. Uh, I believe that Clive Burr was a little bit more straightforward rock, whereas Nico had a little bit more of a classier, jazzier style, which created a different type of pocket with Steve Harris, mm -hmm. which made it even more badass. It allowed for some more creative songwriting, I think. Also, an interesting fact is it's the first album of Iron Maiden's without a title track. Wow, actually, I never, well, really I never paid attention. Yep, they almost called the album as well Food for Thought as a working title and was going to have the album as like Eddie on a, on a table with like his brains all opened up and everyone's eating out of them. Um, but they decided to, uh, I think they were drinking at a pub and decided to just change the album to Peace of Mind. So, hmm. so my last album cover pissed off enough people. I was like, those are fucking really get them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... Classic songs, once again, is The Trooper, Revelations, Quest for Fire, Die With Your Boots On, stuff like that. Uh, high energy still, bomb-ass songwriting, and you can tell they're just getting tighter and tighter as far as writing songs. Yep. So, yep. what do you think, John? Uh, it was number four for me, another great continuation in the mix. Um, I just want to comment, too, on Nico McBrain as well. To do what he does single-footed on a kick drum is amazing. Uh, can't say enough good things about that and i agree like joe said too <laughs> his style of drumming differed from their previous drummer and it it every time you switch up a drummer and get new beats into the mix it allows for a a, a different feel to the music and a, again a different pocket for everybody to fit in and try to write with um the trooper was on this album yeah one of my all-time favorite iron maiden songs everybody loves ever. the trooper um, beautiful again just a great continuation it was it's fun to watch these guys grow as the albums progress so that's how I feel Tomei <laughs> enlighten us please yeah I have peace of mind at number five great album you know uh, I have to bring up the song to tame a land Steve Harris really shines on that song just you know another song telling <laughs> telling you why he's one of the best bass players around um, still life song still life really under, underrated on that. underrated, underrated sure. great leads on that song yeah Heck. i also had it at number five uh i don't think it's quite as good as number of the beast but it's an excellent album uh die with your boots on kind of drives me nuts with the really you can make a drinking game out of it oh my god do that chorus just they, they mm. really labor that point that I, I know what's going to happen when i die that there's going to be boots and they're going to they be, be on and, and they, they will be, be off <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, honestly, it has some of their most recognizable songs. Again, The Trooper, 
Where Eagles Dare, possibly my favorite opening track across the almost the entire discography. Like it's it's up there. That is a killer song. Sun and Steel, really good as well too. And yeah, it's just a solid fucking album. This is a killer one. All right, chugging on down the road, take you to 1984's Power Slave. One of the biggest albums that Iron Maiden has ever done on a few different scales. Uh, I believe it's it may still be to this day their largest tour that they've ever done. The World Slavery Tour. And in my opinion, this was my number one. Um, I would... A long time ago I would disagree, but the more I think about it, this is my number one. And it's for a lot of different reasons. Iron Maiden always has excellent in- imagery, but the... The Egyptian theme stuff was really cool and they did it really well. All the eddies, Egyptian eddies and the mummy eddies and stuff, it was badass. So the artwork was incredibly on point. The music was, you could tell they really pushed themselves to write some incredible songs such as like The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And it has, in my opinion, some of the best guitar solos. Like the guitar solos, Dave Murray's first solo to... Um, Power Slave is one of the most beautiful solos ever and then it just kicks in to just total badassery so for me as a guitar player there's a lot of goosebump moments uh, on that album some cool facts that you might not know about that is the song Flash of the Blade was actually used in Dario Argento's Phenomenon and also Gem the cartoon Gem it was featured in an episode of Gem some douchey guy was walking down with a boombox and it was playing out the uh out the speakers, so wow. hmm. random shit you find on the internet when you do research <laughs> or something, you know what I mean? So fuck it. Tommy, how do you feel about this album? I love Power Slave, it's my number one. You know, it starts out blazing with Aces High. Cannot go wrong with Aces High. <laughs> Two Minutes of Midnight, another classic, pretty much an instant classic. Uh the Gallop on Power Slave. <laughs> so maiden. You know, just that whole song just screams Iron Maiden. Uh, and then the shred comes and amazing album the shred cometh the duelist as well what an epic amazing song that whole album from start to finish is i think it's a perfect album i'm just gonna put that out there <laughs> i'm just gonna fucking put that out there nick this is my number one i mean again another classic you really can't argue with it when you're right you're right you know it happens every now and then uh back in the village is another <laughs> one that didn't get mentioned that yeah. i absolutely love in there too I adore Power Slave. That song has, like, that one brought in some darker sounding elements, too. Like, right Even before. Even the lyrics, man. Yeah. And right before you go into that, uh, the chorus, like, it has those just dark riffs that come in. It's like, dude, this doesn't sound as, like, the upbeat and almost kind of, like, fun made. Like, this is, like, all right, we're getting down and dirty on this one. Love the cover artwork. This song has, this, I'm sorry, this whole album has no weak songs. Like, everything is meticulously written, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Brought in more proggy elements. It's a fantastic album, start to finish. So what all those guys said. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? 16 albums, it gets really hard to rank as you get through this discography. For me, for me this was number three <coughs> for a long time. <clears throat> for a long time, it was my number one. I remember talking to Nick about it a bunch as we were going through it all, going, man, Power Slave is going to take number one. Power Slave is going to take number one. And of course, then I went back and re-listened again to everything, and I was like, "Hey, eh. all the jams are on this album. This, uh, uh, what can I say about this album that uh, these assholes haven't said already?" Yeah, uh, and we are, and, and we are and, assholes. And there is a there's a, a a local band here in town that does a killer cover of Aces High. Uh, I think they're called Constricted. If you haven't heard from them, look them up. Anyway, who are those turds? I, don't, I, have, I have no idea. Album. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, but again, what can I say that these guys haven't already said? Killer album. Their guitar player tries to touch me. <laughs> tries. <laughs> I thought you said it was like appropriately, not inappropriately, though. Appropriately. <laughs> then I touch him back. <laughs> so gay. It's like a two way petting zoo. You pet the animals and they pet you back. <laughs> oh, the Joe and Tommy tickle fights. It's... Oh, Except for you don't have to put a quarter in the oat machine. <laughs> 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 oh my god all right moving on 
<laughs> All right. In walks 1986, Somewhere in Time. If you look at this little gentleman right here, uh, Somewhere in Time has some of the coolest album art that you're going to find uh, on Iron Maiden's albums, even though there's a lot of cool art. What's cool is it kind of sets the scene in a futuristic uh, downtown city with a lot of cool pop culture references, uh, and the dude's just kind of in some street clothes, you know, hanging out on the street. And... There's a lot of self-referential stuff, too, like yeah. the references to other songs. It's the most clever cover they ever did. I love it. There is some confliction, I feel like, with this album because it is the very first time that Iron Maiden introduced synthesizers into their albums. Uh, for me, it was totally cool. Um, I enjoyed it. They did it in a tasteful way, I thought, um, that added to the sound and wasn't just a cop-out for less guitars. There's always plenty of guitars on Iron Maiden albums, and I always appreciate that. But it really set the stage, I think, to set some different kinds of backgrounds that you can't just always make with two guitars. So songs like The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, uh, I think those chorus kind of keys uh, helps Bruce just belt out some beautiful, that's some of my favorite Bruce Dickinson stuff right there, man. The chorus of that song is just incredible. So, Tommy, how'd you feel about that? Yeah, somewhere in time, I did number six. I did up there. I liked the synthesizer thing going on. Um, caught somewhere in time, the song that it starts out with, just blazing. Great intro. Uh, the loneliness of a long distance runner that was just being talked about. Proggy, thrashy, that gallops, fantastic. I liked it. Good album. Uh, Alexander the Great had a really good. The whole middle section of that song was yep. incredible. Yep. Strong way to end a record. John, where'd you place this? Oh, this was my number seven. Good jams. Good times. Good, great records. Great oldies. <laughs> great records, yeah. Um, again, I was going to comment on Alexander the Great and that whole like metal jam section. Um, the song uh, Stranger in a Strange Land It's pretty solid as well. Motherfucker. 25 cents, please. Who, who was You'll that? get my corner. <laughs> Tommy beefed. Hey. So, yeah, it was my number seven. <laughs> It was a good jam. Again, I, I don't have bad things to say about Iron Maiden. Oh, yeah. When when we started this whole ordeal, I was not the world's biggest Maiden fan, I'm going to be honest. So, I'm glad uh, we could corral you. Yeah, man, I, I don't have a bad thing to say at all. Again, 16 albums, when you go to rank them, it gets really difficult somewhere there in the middle. So. Yeah. Yep. All right. It smells like chili. <sighs> I hate you both. It doesn't. Nick! <laughs> How do you feel about this album? I feel like I'm inhaling Tommy's <laughs> asshole right now. But I have this at number six. I really like this album. Uh, to split hairs, they said it was guitar synths on this one versus actual synths. So they kind of like, oh, don't worry, we didn't go full synth. But really catchy songs. I like the fact that they they kind of changed the production and have a more modern sound for that time. Like it felt less the early '80s and more like the late '80s, where production was more polished. And um, I especially like Wasted Years, despite that being one great of the poppiest. Great single. Great songs. single. It's gorgeous. The song's literally perfect. It has a great runtime, carried by epic vocals, great riffs, mm -hmm. awesome leads. It's it's honestly, I think it's one of the best ones that Adrian Smith ever wrote. Because Adrian Smith's a badass. He is. <laughs> Loneliness, the mm -hmm. long distance runner, Sea of Madness. I absolutely love that one. Oh. It it felt it felt like they changed, but they still retained everything it, at the core. Yeah. It just, they they enhanced it, you know. Yeah, the sound was altered a little bit, but you know, any Meyer main fan knows they eventually go back and do some of the more classic sounding stuff. But it was a nice venture into some uncharted territory. It was a, it was a risk that paid off. I think yeah. this 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 um definitely. I mean, it doesn't fall as it doesn't go as high as some of the other ones, but it definitely is usually in that top five, top six for me at least. Here's a quarter for the fart bucket. Piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on to 1988's Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. Now, personally, this is my number two album. I absolutely adore this album. Uh, right from the rip, Moonchild is an incredible jam. 
Um, I remember hearing that album for the first time and hearing Moonchild and the chorus to that. I was just like, fucking Bruce is just killing it. Yeah, dude. I love Bruce. It goes without saying that Bruce is one of the greatest vocalists of all time, but he's also personally one of probably my one of my top three, four vocalists of all time. So when that guy starts belting it out, it gives me fucking goosebumps. I love hearing that dude sing. The Seventh Son was actually a concept album based on, what is this guy's name? Orson Scott Card's Seventh Son. Um, so it's a pretty cool concept album with, you know, yeah, they made a, a cheesy song in the album, but overall, I think this album kicks ass. It's one of the best and most creative things I think they've ever done. Um, if you listen to Iron Maiden, you can tell that they definitely have a good solid formula. Uh, I thought this broke the formula a little bit more than some of the other albums. And for that reason, I loved the shit out of it. Also, this is the first time that you not only have synthesizers, but full on keyboards in the album. Oh yeah. Now I'm gonna kick it over to Nick first. Nick, what do you feel? Hmm. I know you have a have an opinion on this. Uh, this one fell to number nine for me. I'm not the biggest fan of this one. Um, I think it was a little too synth drenched, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say it that uh, "Can I Play with Madness" sounds like it was written by Mike Rutherford from Can Genesis. Can I play John Madden? <laughs> Which I love Genesis, but I didn't want a Genesis song in an Iron Maiden album. Uh, and also, I think the title track runs too long and it tries to be as epic as Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner or Alexander the Great. I think it was. It's not. It, it really, it's like, it has a cool middle bridge part, but it's a really dull song. But there are great songs in here. The Evil the Men Do, I love that one. Infinite Dreams, Moonchild's a fun one right out of the gate. All in all, it's, it's kind of falls in the lower half for me. It's, it's not one I go back to right as much. On. Do you kind of think that the keyboards and the synthesizers, too? Is that what... I know it's not very high on your list. Is that yeah, kind of what... Yeah, it's number 13. Would you say it's I've, because the keyboards and the synths? Just because it's lot not of your it, personal taste? A lot of it. Okay. Yeah, my personal taste, I don't... And I'm probably gonna you don't get fuck aside. around with keyboards, I'm probably going to get man. Aside of this, but <laughs> Keyboards, in my opinion, when you put them especially into metal albums, have to be really well done. They have to be not so much prevalent in the fact that they sound like a synth, but that they sound like a, a different album, not or a different uh, instrument, instrument, not a keyboard. Like, it has to really kind of mesh in there well. And if it doesn't do that for me, it kills the sound. Um, for me, as far as this record is concerned, outside of, and this is my personal take, outside of the clairvoyant, nothing really stuck out for me was a good in this one album. Too. It so. feels very 80s pop. Like, and that's not a bad thing. I love 80s pop, but... It shouldn't be on an Iron Man now, Agreed. in my opinion. Yep, and that's my thing. I, I just don't think that that sound had any place in their... what they have. You know, I mean, <laughs> come to my rescue. Come to my motherfucking rescue. And you out there in internet land, you fuckers come to my rescue. Seven Sons, a badass fucking album. I need your guys' help. Middle of the pack at best. Uh, I definitely agree with uh, Joe here and disagree with these two other guys. I have this album at number three. It's definitely high up there. Yes, the cheesy vocals on Can I Play With Madness was a little over the top, you know, but the music was fucking killer on that song. It was. Uh, the Evil That Men Do, you can't go wrong. I even liked the title track, Seventh Son of the Seventh Son. I loved it. I thought it was a great album start to finish. Don't, I personally don't mind keyboards, you know. It's another instrument being added. If every album sounded the same, Iron Maiden wouldn't be as good to me. All right. Okay. Moving forward, 1990s No Prayer for the Dying. You've got nothing to lose, yeah. Now, this is a sad day in Iron Maiden's history for me because prior to the i believe it was in pre-productions for this album adrian smith decided that the direction they were going musically uh wasn't for him anymore and he decided to bow out so bruce dickinson brought in his solo guitarist for the album tattooed millionaire yannick gares so yannick also jammed with ian gillen uh, on his solo albums from deep purple and also i believe he worked with fish from the progressive rock band marillion um, back in the day a little bit. Uh, he's kind of all over. He's a cool dude. To me, Yannick Gares is more of a Dave Murray style player. Like he just does a lot of legato technique and stuff, which is fine. 
But part of the greatness of the duo for me of Dave and Adrian was because they were such different players, they complemented each other so well. So in my mind, Yannick Gares was just someone who was more in the vein of Dave Murray rather than having that nice second half. So for me, that's why I was never really strongly cared for this album. And it's nothing personal against Yannick. It's, I think it's just a testament to uh, my thought that Adrian Smith's presence in Iron Maiden is incredibly important. John, what do you think? Uh, this ranked at my number 11. Uh, the, the sound got a little more polished, and that was kind of cool. Uh, the vocals seemed a little bit more straightforward, as far as all that's concerned. <laughs> um, look, bring your daughter to the slaughter. <laughs> Can we just talk about that? I, I can't. I just Let can't. her go. Let her go. I just I can't. Let her go. <laughs> There's another drinking game song. <laughs> you'd be you'd be hammer smashed <laughs> by like the first minute and a half. I can't. I don't get it. I don't get. I don't get why that yeah. has to be repeated over and you over. You swing and, and sometimes you strike out. What are you gonna do? Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah, I had this album pretty low. I had it at number fifteen. You know, there was some good songs on here. <laughs> there was uh, a lot of the songs felt kind of cheesy to me. The album was okay. Even the bad Iron Maiden albums, or the lower-ranked Iron Maiden albums, are still good albums. Um, it just, I don't know. The solo on Holy Smoke, rip it. That's, of course. Yeah. I, the song Fate's Warning, the song Mother Russia, good songs. I have to actually say that, to Dave Murray's credit, I feel like when Adrian Smith left, he he fucking went ape shit. Like, the the solos are the best... I'll, I'll, I'll explain myself later on, but... During the time without Adrian Smith, I think Dave Murray just fucking went ham and and has some of his coolest, bombest solos uh, in that time period as well. So, just something I wanted to add there. Uh, Nick, how'd you feel about this album? This one's near the bottom of the pack at 15. Uh, I'm just going to say it. I just don't like this album. This really is <laughs> a good album. There's a couple of songs. Like, all right, Public Enema, number one, is a decent song. The title's really dumb it sounds like a new metal track run silent yes. run deeps okay like okay i, I mean like, all right i get it. The, the musical landscape was changing thrash was still pretty much king death metal was coming up they wanted to maybe try to appeal to a heavier generation that was getting the heavier stuff but at the same time retain their sound and they just kind of felt lost in this and without adrian to help guide the ship towards better songs Oh, man like the lyrics were dumbed down bring your daughter to the slaughter I can't. fuck man. i can't I can't. It, it's just. I don't understand. And like some of the, all right, and, and all right, hooks in you. The only writing credit that Adrian Smith has, and it's one of the kitschiest songs on there too. Of course it is. Bruce tries doing harsher vocals, and he just sounds out of his element. He's not belting forth these awesome, powerful opuses. It's just kind of shrieking and shredding his vocal cords. It's not a good album. I'll, no, it's not. <laughs> all right. This is the end of part one. This thing is so long we had to break it down into two parts. That's what she said. Uh, Gross. Too. So be on the lookout for part two as well.